Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Yang, and I'm the co-founder of the K. Lisa Yang and Hop E10 Center for Molecular Therapeutics in Neuroscience at MIT. For the next hour, four scientists from the McGovern Institute will whisk you from today's surreal pandemic, Alice in Wonderland world of the Mad Hatter and the Mad Tea Party to look into some of the most exciting, cutting edge research underway at the center that's paving the way for novel brain disorder therapies. Across the world, there are millions of families who are living with chronic, complex, and more often than not debilitating brain disorders, including autism, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, depression, and epilepsy. I believe it's vital to create opportunities that enable individuals with all kinds of abilities to thrive and lead meaningful lives. But for many people with profound and intractable brain disorders, Today's treatments are lacking. Indeed, for the past several decades, true therapeutic breakthroughs for the most severe forms of brain disorders have been few and far between. Some of the challenges touch on very tough problems that scientists have been grappling with for many years, such as more effective ways to deliver therapies across the blood-brain barrier or new gene therapy tools that can treat disease at its root genetic mutation. Rather than help to make incremental progress, I'm willing to invest in the exploration of non-conventional ideas. I'm hopeful that a new lens on revolutionary technologies that harness genetic and molecular discoveries, as well as unorthodox computational and engineering approaches can be successful in the search for effective therapeutics. The goal of the center is to take these new therapeutic tools for the toughest neurological diseases to clinical trials during this decade. It is my expectation that the discoveries made in the center will extend well beyond the brain and shape future treatments for a multitude of diseases. I will now let the brilliant scientists at the McGovern Institute give you a sneak peek into the incredible and game-changing potential of molecular therapeutics. Enjoy. Hello, I guess I'm gonna be my, your guide on this sneak peek. I'm Carrie Goldberg. I'm a health and science reporter for WBUR and I'm editor of WBUR's Common Health blog. I'll be moderating for the next hour as we hear from these scientists. And I wanna welcome you and thank you for joining us today. As uh, Lisa said, our topic is the incredible world of molecular therapeutics and specifically how radical new molecular methods are paving the way for promising new ways to treat devastating brain disorders. So uh, before we get started, a few quick housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded. It's closed captioned. We'll have an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask our panelists questions in the second half hour of the discussion. If you'd like to ask a question, you just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type it in. And if you see a question that someone else has asked that interests you, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up icon next to the question. And it's a good idea to do that because we probably won't have time to get to all the questions. So at this point, I was planning to mention the coronavirus pandemic and how among the very many things it makes harder, it makes living with a brain disorder that much harder too. But I think instead I'd like to emphasize that I'm thrilled not to be talking about COVID-19, which I've been covering nonstop for the last eight months. And just to share with you that probably my very favorite part of my job is when I get to talk with people like the researchers you'll hear from today. I just, I personally find their brilliance and their diligence very comforting, especially now when we're all kind of waiting for the science cavalry to come save us. And so I hope that you will too. So today's topic, molecular therapeutics. Let's do first a very basic definition 
molecular therapeutics, it's traditionally referred to chemicals used as therapeutic drugs like lithium, Ritalin, SSRIs. Today, we will be discussing the next generation of therapeutic molecules. These are molecules that are designed to more specifically target the genes or brain regions that are relevant to a specific disorder. So next generation molecular therapeutics go beyond basic chemistry using highly engineered biologics and complexes of chemicals and nano devices for targeted drug delivery. Okay, so let's start with a term that I think is probably very familiar to many, CRISPR. We've all been hearing about its incredible potential. CRISPR is a natural defense system used by bacteria to fend off viruses. And our panelist Feng Zheng, McGovern Institute investigator and James and Patricia Poitras, professor in neuroscience at MIT, did absolutely seminal work on how CRISPR could be a very effective way of precisely cutting DNA strands in the human genome. In a few short years, the CRISPR toolbox has rapidly grown. We've seen the creation of powerful new engineering techniques like the use of jumping genes to replace gene mutations. CRISPR is already being tested as a gene therapy in clinical trials, and the results so far are promising. And CRISPR is just one of several innovative breakthroughs that we'll be talking about today with our panelists. All of them are investigators at MIT's McGovern Institute for Brain Research, and they're all members of the new K. Lisa Yang and Hawk E. Tan Center for Molecular Therapeutics. Um, next up, our panelist, Polina Anikeva, is an associate professor in MIT's Department of Materials Science and Engineering. She's creating new ways of binding metals to drug molecules so that magnets can be used to target drugs specifically to the brain regions that are afflicted without becoming diluted in the rest of the body. And we'll be discussing new disease models, like those you'll hear about from Guo Ping Feng, who is currently the Poitras Professor of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. These models are enabling scientists and biotech firms to test new therapeutics on brains much closer to our own than mouse brains. Our panelist, Ed Boyden, is the Y. Eva Tan Professor of Neurotechnology at MIT. I usually just refer to him as neuroengineer Ed Boyden. <laughs> he is renowned for the development of optogenetics, by which neuronal activity can be genetically controlled by light, by defined wavelengths of light. It's a method that's now in clinical trials for retinitis pigmentosa, for example. And today he'll describe how the new tools his group is creating are enabling scientists to tackle neuroscience's most significant problems, such as how to successfully move molecules across the blood-brain barrier. You'll hear how today's panelists continue to bring radical ideas that sound like science fiction into reality and how their advances could shape how doctors will be treating complex and devastating diseases like schizophrenia, Parkinson's, bipolar, autism, Alzheimer's, depression, and others in the near future. So the overarching theme for today is the hope to redefine molecular therapeutics for the next generation by considering how to evolve traditional chemical and biologic drugs into smart drugs that we can direct in time and space. Um, one quick note before we get started is that all four of our panelists are involved in basic science and engineering. They're not clinicians, and so they can't recommend treatments or, or give any kind of medical advice. Okay, so fun. I'd like to start with you. We've recently seen CRISPR gene editing techniques move into clinical trials for cancer, blood disorders, and blindness, among other diseases. It, it's going incredibly quickly, actually. How are you going about bringing CRISPR editing tools to the brain, and what are the top challenges you face as you do this? Yeah. Thank you, Carrie, for the question. It's really a pleasure to be a part of this, um, this really nice panel. Um, I made a couple of slides to give uh, everyone a the basic sense of what we're working on. Um, so in essence, we've been working on uh, developing molecular uh, therapeutics uh, for the brain. And uh, molecular, th uh, molecular therapeutics are modular uh, in the sense that if you think about sending a satellite into space, uh, what is being uh, done is that you have a vehicle, which is a rocket, and then the payload, which is um, that, uh, that satellite they're trying to deliver. Molecular uh, therapeutics are modular in this way too. And, and uh, one of the ways that people realize 
uh, this is by using vehicles in the form of a virus. Uh, we're now living through a pandemic, so virus is, is very much at the center of this. And so this is um, like a virus where scientists are able to remove everything that is pathogenic about the virus, getting rid of the natural uh, pathogenic DNA from the virus and replacing it with the payload, which is a therapeutic molecule. And so this is that modular system. You can take a virus uh, as the vehicle and, and, and fit into it different kinds of payloads in order to be able to carry out uh, the, the desired therapeutic outcome that you want to achieve. So what we have been working on over the past number of years has been to harness from nature's diversity um, to develop these therapeutic molecules. Nature is, is um, probably the most brilliant uh, engineer there is. Uh, if you just look around us, the bacteria that live uh, in our own uh, in intestines uh, to uh, all of the, the uh, plants and also animals that live around us have each uh, developed very uh, diverse molecular mechanisms that may be harnessed uh, for uh, therapeutic applications. On this slide are uh, three different examples of how we have explored nature's diversity. Uh, on the left side, um, this is a, uh, a picture, microscope picture of cyanobacteria. These are uh, the algae or the pond scum that you find uh, in, the, in the Charles River, for example. And by looking into um, one of the molecular machineries in the cyanobacteria, we're able to find a, a programmable jumping gene so that you can uh, design it and program it to be able to introduce DNA sequences to specific locations in the genome. Uh, this is very useful for replacing faulty genes, uh, genes that uh, have carried a mutation in a disease, uh, or uh, to be able to introduce a new gene so that you can, um, for example, uh, confer um, uh, cancer recogni uh, recognition uh, to a immune cell so that you can go in and destroy tumor cells uh, that it wasn't able to destroy effectively before. Over on the right, um, on the top, um, are some examples of these different um, other different molecular machines that we're able to find from nature's diversity. Uh, this one here is Cas9. Uh, this is the most um, sort of uh, uh, widely used uh, CRISPR protein for editing. But then there are also other DNA editing machineries like, uh, like Cas12A and Cas12B, uh, and also RNA uh, targeting machineries like Cas13. And these come from all sorts of bacteria, some from human pathogens like Cas9, uh, others from thermophilic bacteria like Cas12b, or from, from uh, bacteria that live on our gum, uh, dental uh, bacteria um, uh, like the Cas13. So, so they really come from everywhere uh, in nature. And then on the bottom right um, is, is another uh, approach that we have been working on uh, for RNA editing. Rather than editing the DNA, uh, it's also possible to edit RNA. And this has uh, different functions as well uh, for therapeutic as applications where DNA editing uh, may not be as easy to achieve uh, or, or you may want the, the effect to be uh, more transient rather than a permanent effect. So these are just some examples. What is super exciting is that scientists are continuing to map uh, the world's natural diversity. And by diving deep into these diverse uh, DNA or RNA sequences, uh, we can find uh, many more uh, interesting molecular machines and turn them into uh, useful um, uh, therapeutic molecules. And so, so we're really starting to look at, look at a, a wealth of, uh, a, really a, a treasure chest of different machineries that we can uh, use to improve our, our, our health. Um, thank you. Thank you, Fang. So, one follow-up question, and I remember, I think I, I I was once interviewing you and I like tortured you on this because I couldn't quite understand it. When it comes to the brain, mm -hmm. why is it that RNA-related editing seems to be most important? What are the advantages? Why, why is it so important that in the CRISPR toolbox, we have these RNA tools for the brain? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, for editing in the brain, um, there, are, there are a number of different challenges. One of them is that editing the DNA uh, in, in any cell requires cells to be able to actively replicate and, and divide because the machineries or some of the machineries involved in uh, those kinds of repair 
are, are linked to cell division, but brain cells don't divide. And so if you are to um, edit DNA in the brain uh, in, in different kinds of ways, sometimes you're limited because of that lack of cell division. RNA editing takes a different approach uh, where you don't rely on um, the cellular machinery. Uh, you deliver everything you need to edit DNA right there into the cells that you want to change. And you can go and make very precise uh, changes and also add very high efficiency. The other um, aspect of RNA editing is that RNA editing uh, can be transient. Um, so it provides advantages where you don't want the change to be there permanently. For example, there are changes in a cell, uh, an edit that you can make to an RNA in the cell that can cause um, cells to proliferate or to divide and differentiate. Uh, you may not want to do that for forever because you'll end up with a tumor and, and too much cell growth. Uh, and you want to just pulse it, uh, do it for, for a short window of time. And, and that's where um, having RNA editing, which, um, which you know, turns over after a short period of time uh, is also advantageous. Uh, but overall, I think having a, a broad toolbox where you can do um, many different types of changes to cells uh, is going to be uh, the best because you can pick and choose the, the most suitable approach uh, for the specific uh, healthcare problem that we're trying to tackle. So labeling what you're about to say very clearly as many years away and only a concept and just kind of your imagination at work. But still, how could you imagine using RNA editing if let's say I have a brain disease like Parkinson's or autism or bipolar disorder or depression? So, um, so one of the aspects that I talked about um, today are the, are the cargos or the payloads that we put into a delivery system. But another major problem for brain uh, uh, therapy is the vehicle itself. Uh, how do we build the, the best rocket to be able to put into the right brain cells in the right part of the brain? And, and that I think uh, a lot of scientists are working on and we're also working on as well, uh, will um, we'll sort of complement all of the editing machineries, whether it's DNA or RNA, to be able to treat uh, brain illness. So while this is not quite ready yet, um, I think in the coming decade, we're gonna see tremendous advance um, both on the vehicle and on the payload front. And that synthesis uh, will, will unleash a lot of new therapeutics. Okay, thank you, Fang. Paulina, I wanna to turn to you now. So in recent years, your lab is focused on designing and fabricating smarter molecules that are equipped with magnetic steering. This is so cool. To enable guided non-invasive delivery of drugs deep into the brain. So can you talk a little bit about this approach and the sorts of treatments that maybe it could help bring one day to the clinic? Thank you, Carrie. So I, just as fun, I'm going to share a few slides to help articulate this point. So my group at MIT designs magnetic nanoparticles and we use them as transducers of signals to cells. So what are the magnetic nanoparticles? They're essentially specks of material that is very similar to rust. And they're about maybe one five thousandth of your hair in di diameter. And over the past decade, we have learned how to make them in a variety of shapes and sizes and materials. For example, we can make little spheres or icosahedrons, but we can also make disks or even little donuts. And this diversity of properties translates into diversity of functions. So what can magnetic particles do for neurobiology? Well, because they are magnetic, they respond to magnetic field. And this is important because all biological tissues, you and I and everyone on this panel, we are transparent to magnetic field. And this means that all the fields can go through us without causing an effect or any kind of harm to the tissue. And those fields that I'm talking about are tiny. They're not like a giant magnetic resonance imaging field. There may be one thousandths of that. And this means we can use these fields to trigger different processes in deep inside the body remotely using our magnetic particles. 
For example, a really tiny spherical particles like these ones can uh, dissipate heat when an alternating field is applied externally. And that field oscillates really quickly at the kilohertz rate. But this disk particles instead can vibrate in a slowly varying magnetic field. So now you can see how can we deliver those signals from far away. But most importantly, all of these particles being magnetic, they can be moved around with magnetic fields. This means we can inject them into the bloodstream and guide them to the organ of interest, for example, to the brain. And there we can place them in the direct, in the correct location to avoid any kind of uh, side effects. And to take advantage of this magnetic delivery, we are proposing to package therapies into magnetic nanobots together with our magnetic particles. So what uh, this, the way we can design these nanobots is we can make this shell sensitive to a stimulus, for example, a heat or uh, a vibration that we can deliver remotely. And now we can envision a therapy when the, a molecule or a drug is packaged into this nanobot, we then take this nanobot and we guide it to the brain, to a specific location, and then we apply a specific magnetic signal that is going to trigger either heating or vibration of this little engines and that will permeabilize our nanobot and release a therapeutic exactly where it is needed. So why is this important? Well, if you're thinking about most common treatment for neurological disorders or for mental health conditions, those treatments usually involve drugs. Those drugs are taken orally or injected and they're not targeted, which means they go everywhere. And because they go everywhere, they can cause significant side effects. For instance, antidepressants may cause undesired weight gain or weight loss. Uh, Painkillers often are accompanied with constipation. So, but now imagine if I took a therapeutic that targets a particular brain uh, circuit and deliver it inside this magnetic carrier only to the place where it is needed most, we can avoid all of those side effects altogether. Beautiful. So one clarifying question. Um, I understood how you can use these nanobots to deliver therapies to one particular part of the brain or another, but I didn't understand how the magnetic nanobots help you get past the blood-brain barrier. So this is the money question, Carrie. Yeah. So there, uh, we have some ideas. So specifically, uh, the nanobots uh, can package molecules that when they're heated up, which we can do with our nanoparticles externally, those molecules fall apart and release a gas called nitric oxide. And that a little bit of that gas can temporarily permeabilize the barrier between blood mm -hmm. and the brain. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to kind of temporarily open this door into the brain for the therapeutic to follow the suit. Got it. Very cool. So what you're talking about is material science, basically. And so I would imagine everything you just described needs a great deal of knowledge about the characteristics of different materials, as well as the properties of the brain itself. Can you give us an idea of the way you think about these different characteristics when you go about creating new techniques to treat brain disorders? So um, this, is, uh, this is exactly um, sort of our uh, everyday business. So our group actually draws inspiration from both neurobiology and from physics to design new magnetic materials. And uh, we aspire to shift the focus from bulky devices that are large and are used in clinic for therapies, as well as away from the drugs that have uh, undesirable side effects towards therapies that really get at the molecular and circuit uh, origins of actual diseases so that we can treat not the symptoms, 
but the fundamental underlying issues. And at the most fundamental level, the function of the nervous system is largely governed by the workings of the proteins that transport ions across membranes of neurons. And these proteins are the gatekeepers of neural activity. And if we can control those gatekeepers, then we can treat neurological and mental health conditions uh, from fundamental principles. And it turns out that those gatekeeper proteins, those ion transporters, they're about a few nanometers in size, so also just about one five thousandths of your hair. And if we um, learn to, that means that the tools um, that we need to use to control this um, nanometer scale objects should also operate at nanometer scale. And that's the inspiration for using nanoparticles. But now, Think about these proteins, these gatekeepers, they all can be triggered by different stimuli. Some of them respond to chemicals, drugs, others respond to heat, others respond to tension. And now, if we design our magnetic particles to transduce signals from the magnetic field to any of those stimuli, then we should be able to control those molecules wirelessly and non-invasively at the nanoscale. So to accomplish this, we start from theoretical physics principles to understand how different magnetic materials respond to different magnetic fields that are safe for, 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 for humans and, uh, and animals. And then we turn to synthetic chemistry to actually create those particles. And then finally, we investigate their materials properties to compare the um, uh, uh, those results with our initial predictions. And the cycle goes on and on until we finally identify a material that can act as a remote controller for one of those channels, for those ion transporters, or that can act as an engine for those magnetic nanobots by guiding and delivering a molecular therapeutic payload where it is needed. Okay, so I have about a hundred questions on that, but we're going to have to let it go and move on to Ed Boyder. Ed, your lab has developed many new tools to visualize brain activity at a scale we couldn't even begin to imagine just a few years ago. How do these tools that you've developed help scientists overcome some of the biggest challenges in developing new therapeutics? Thanks. It's really great to be here as part of the launch of this new center. Um, well, the brain is really complicated. You know, in a cubic millimeter of brain tissue, you have 100,000 brain cells and the connections between them, fine nanoscale connections, there are about a billion of those called synapses. And so if we wanna understand a brain disorder to the point where we can targetedly uh, fix it or remedy it, we have to know what's going on. You know, there are thousands of genes in the genome that change their expression. They can change the location of the gene products. What's really going on in the brain? So we've been working on ways to try to visualize what are previously invisible things in the brain. Um, High-speed activity, nanoscale features. I can just show you a couple of pictures of the kinds of things that we're trying to do. One big problem with the brain is that brain cells and brain regions are large objects, macroscopic objects, but the wiring of the brain and the biomolecules, those gene products are nanoscale and often organized with nanoscale precision. How can you see something that's nanoscale in the context of something that's large? Well, about five years ago, we announced an interesting discovery. We could take brain specimens, not living ones, and infuse them with a chemical that's a lot like the stuff in baby diapers, a swellable polymer, process the tissue just right and add water, and we can blow it up. So panel B here is a piece of the mouse brain. Panel C is the same piece of mouse brain tissue about a day and a half later, and we've increased it in its size by about a hundredfold in volume. What that means is you can see very fine features in the brain, like the wiring of the brain. You can also look at the organization of biomolecules. I'm working with lots of people now to try to figure out in a variety of diseases um, and neurological and psychiatric conditions, what are the molecular changes in the brain? So the idea here is that we can make these invisible nanoscale features large and obvious. We can bring the invisible into the realm of the visible. But this only works on preserved brain tissues, not living ones. And so in recent years, we've also started trying to evolve molecules that can light up brain cells 
when they are active. This is difficult because you need to match the high speed of activity of the brain. And also brain cells are delicate. You have to be able to watch them in action without hurting them. So just as the natural world, as Fung outlined in the beginning, uh, evolves molecules with interesting properties, can we evolve molecules in the laboratory? And we built robots to let you do just that, to make molecules better towards some goal. Using these, we are excited to try to look at how the brain computations are changing in disease states. So to summarize, we're very excited about ways of looking at the structure of the brain and the dynamics of the brain. And can we take those invisible changes and make them obvious? And now we're doing a lot of work also on computational strategies, machine learning and artificial intelligence strategies to extract the meaning from these very compl complex maps. Could you figure out a new therapeutic target by looking at data that people have not been able to see before? And uh, what about, do you have a particular approach to the blood brain barrier also? And, and what's your thought process on that? Sure. Well, uh, as I mentioned in that little slide, uh, we think a lot about how to automate um, evolution in the laboratory. How do we scale up um, the ability to evolve new molecules that can do interesting things like transport a payload um, across the blood brain barrier or do other um, important feats in the realm of molecular therapeutics. And so one idea is uh, with these novel robots that allow us to evolve molecules, can we evolve a molecule that will get a certain payload across the blood brain barrier? Um, you know, nature is a great designer, but maybe we could try to recapitulate some of the process that nature uses in the laboratory. And evolving molecules towards a goal can be very powerful because sometimes we don't know what we want. <laughs> However, we know where we want to go. And so we can try to coax these molecules along that evolutionary path uh, by making lots of mutations, selecting for the mutants that are better for a certain goal, and then repeating that process over and over again. That totally makes sense. Thank you. And last but very much not least, Guo Ping Feng, um, coming to us from Shanghai, by the way, so um, he gets extra points. Guo Ping, mice have been the primary model for disease research in the scientific world for over a century, but there are growing concerns that the brains of mice are just not close enough to our own, and that this could be a key reason why progress in developing new treatments for brain diseases has largely stalled, and hasn't totally stalled, but it's not going as quickly as we'd like. So can you talk a little bit about new understandings of brain activity at the level of single cells and how that could be helping scientists make progress in developing new treatments? Sure. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so I want to also show us slides just to illustrate this. So, um, you know, in the field of neuroscience, most of our studies are based on mice. But as we all know, mice are very different in their brain structure and function to the human brains. And so one of the key things is in the human brain, the biggest part of our brain actually is called prefrontal cortex. This is the most important part for control our high cognitive function, like working memories, our emotions. And the, Mice or rats, which is the most commonly used models, base, barely have this part. So then you can tell if we want to study brain disorders, which will of, often involve the dysfunction of higher brain functions, and it's really difficult to study them. And you can also imagine without this part of brain, their brain circuits, everything is very different. So it's harder to translate into clinical, into human studies. So you already, you know, Fen, Fen Zhang already talked about the CRISPR technology basically allow us now have new models um, much closer to human uh, uh, brain function or at a cellular level. For example, we can take the human skin cells and uh, turn it into neurons from the patient or from the you know, um, uh, healthy individuals. Turning into neurons, now we can use CRISPR make the exact same mutations. And that, another important aspect is now we can go beyond the models of our mice. We can make non-human primate models, which will be much closer to our, uh, our human brains. So with this kind of new model, now we can actually do at the really you know, discover new target for molecular therapy. So now with the new single cell technology, you basically can compare the gene expressing changes at the, any different, uh, at a different time, developmental time and at 
every single cell in the brain, you can know what is what has been changed during development, what has been changed during the disease progress, and what is changed at the end of. And so at the end, you will know exactly what neural circuits and what cell type has been changed. N now you can, with this knowledge, you know which cells or which cell types I need to target to, you know, to let's say treat depression or stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So these are now, it's, you know, it's not here yet, but you can see in the near future, scientists will be able to develop a very specific molecular target and treat this kind of um, brain disorders. It makes so much sense because mice are, they really are so, so different. We desperately needed new models. So another question sort of related, we know that certain symptoms cut across multiple brain disorders. For instance, we, we see obsessive thoughts in OCD and anxiety and autism spectrum disorders, insomnia in Parkinson's and depression and other diseases. Can you tell us about how scientists are creating treatments that may be effective for multiple diseases with overlapping symptoms rather than just treating each disease as a separate diagnosis? Yeah, that's a really uh, a very good question. Also a very cutting edge question. So, so the field, you know, the neuroscience field, both basic scientists and clinical scientists, now we're thinking this very differently. It's not, you know, the reason is uh, not only clinical evidence, but also their molecular cellular genetic evidence now with large scale genetic studies, which contribute into many of the neural uh, brain disorders, especially psychiatric disorders. Uh, many of the risk genes are overlapping between these disorders. So the, the approach now is thinking instead of just study individual uh, the disease indivi disorders individually, now we study cross border to look at what are common and for example, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, let's say sleep disruptions. They are coming in, you know, in depression, in schizophrenia, in autism, uh, uh, other neurodevelopment disorders. But they all have in the brain, if we understand the neuroscience, they all control by the particular circuits that regulate our sleep. Mm -hmm. So if we can have a very specific target to modulate the sleep, then it can be used cross disorders instead of for individual just for sleep disruption, but you can also use it for neurodevelopment disorders or for depression patients. Similar things for obsessive compulsive source or other uh, symptoms. So. Got it, totally makes sense. Okay, we now move on to audience questions. Again, you're welcome to type your question into the Q&A below the video stream or to upvote any question that someone has already asked by clicking on the thumbs up icon next to it. We've gotten quite a few questions already. Um, several are about how CRISPR can be used to protect against Alzheimer's. Is there a way we could use CRISPR to engineer ourselves to be resistant to diseases of aging like Alzheimer's? Um, Fung, I think that's for you unless anybody else wants it. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. I'll start. Maybe Guo Ping can uh, join me as well. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for Alzheimer's is understanding the uh, the, con the different contributors to the disease process. Um, how do genetics contribute? Um, how do different mutations, uh, inherited or otherwise, uh, contribute to Alzheimer's disease? And how do other uh, environmental factors and, and epigenetic changes contribute to Alzheimer's? Um, I think being able to use CRISPR um, to treat Alzheimer's is still uh, in the in the you know future. But in the meantime, scientists are already using CRISPR to map um, and identify the function of different genetic mutations and understand how they contribute uh, to Alzheimer's or brain degeneration. And I think um, by using uh, these kinds of uh, genetic uh, editing approaches like CRISPR, um, we can start to uh, unravel the mechanism, and then maybe a number of years from now, we'll be able to um, use that understanding to be able to develop a treatment. Uh, so, so it's gonna be a little little ways off, but, um, but CRISPR is playing a role in, uh, in advancing the, the speed of the discoveries. Like I could imagine if you have the ApoE4 gene that inclines you, gives you a, a, a predisposition toward Alzheimer's, you would wanna mm -hmm. fix it. 
Well, <laughs> Ping, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. So I so this is something we have been thinking as many. Uh, for give an example, I think from the preventive point of view is actually a really interesting point. So there are studies now uh, uh, study people who live over a hundred years old, but they are still extremely healthy and as sharp as you know young people. So why do the people are so resistant? Right, so, so that study have identified a few really key genes are different from them. So they are genes, if you don't have that, uh, that kind of uh, um, expression patterns, then you are protected. So these could be potentially in the future use gene therapy to modify them that mimic the condition of in these very long lived healthy um, people with very you know, um, you know, clear brain or clear mind. So that's a, a direction many people are looking at them now. I think we're accumulating more and more data, use these technologies. Of course, you want to model them in animals, uh, models how this can you know, improve the uh, you know, uh, brain function and whether this can be applied in the future. This is still a long way to go, but we do have some directions now from human genetic data. Interesting. Speaking for myself, I hope that work is done very quickly because I need it sooner rather than later, which brings me to a, a question that has come in from the audience. What is the time horizon to start using molecular therapies? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly who that should go to. Guoping, maybe you again, or does anybody else want to volunteer? Fine. Yeah, so I can start, I think, you know, um, Maybe Paulina and uh, Fenza and, and Ed can uh, chime in. So, so it, it, it will depend on, so there are many different ways to think about the molecular therapeutics. If we think about the uh, molecular therapeutics for cell type specific modification, you know, modulation for a particular symptom, that's actually within next five years, we will have things you know, not necessarily exactly from this uh, uh, center, but it may be facilitated by some discovery from this center and to go into clinical trials. Because we neuroscientists have been studying the brain function for a long time, just they were not, they, there was not a easy way to identify cell type specific targets. Now we can identify them. And with advanced model, animal models, we can test them in, in models first, then move on to clinic. The other aspect actually we see a lot of future is a very specific targeted, we call the monogenic um, you know, uh, brain disorders. For example, there are about 25% of neurodevelopment disorders, including severe autism spectrum disorders, they are caused by single gene mutation. Mm -hmm. We can fix that. And these are also we can see in the next five years, some of them will go into clinical trials. Actually, we, my lab is working with some uh, groups at the Broad Institute and with Fen Zhang are trying to develop ways that we can test in animal models and cellular models and move on into. Um, uh, so we, I'm very excited about this center and this made it possible, actually make it possible to test all these things and within, uh, you know, at least in our lifetime, really moving some of them into clinics. So actually, I'd just like to follow up on that because that was a very striking thing that you said. So basically, if 25% of autism spectrum disorders roughly are single gene disorders, you're saying that within the next several years, you should be able to use gene editing or some other molecular therapy to what? To treat those disorders in a way that could what? <laughs> Reduce? Yeah. Symptoms? So yeah. So um, of course, not all of them, but some of them are already in the preclinical development. Actually, we can um, either dramatically improve them or actually um, potentially cure them. Because for this very severe neurodevelopment disorder, and the, especially with intellectual disability, and the, it will be very hard for them to have an independent life. So our goal is to improve that make it possible for them to live an independent life like we do. And uh, so the, by fixing their genetic, because we know they are monogenic, they are single gene mutations, uh, these are very severe. And if we can change that gene back to normal, depend on when, if you change it early enough, you know, very, when they are very young, our brains are very plastic, then the, 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 you know, the correct, the, the correct the cells will take over and make new connections and correct all the problems. So you will see a very dramatic improvement. 
we already see in mo mo uh, animal models. So now that is how do we make this safely into humans in the next five years? Striking. Um, does anybody else want to talk about time horizon? Uh, Paulina, Ed, Funk. So let me add um, to uh, a different perspective to what uh, Guo Ping was talking about. So some of the types of tools that we are working on could be um, either on the earlier scale of development or facilitate some of the tools that Guaping and Fung are developing and kind of accelerate that process as well. So uh, for example, the um, magnetic carriers that we are working with, the magnetic particles uh, we're using are very similar to already clinically approved contrast agents used for MRI. It's just, um, it's a, a better formulation that is tuned to do a different, uh, different work, different job. But um, chemically it's quite similar. So from approval standpoint, maybe it will help. And then from, um, if you're using those um, magnetic carriers to deliver drugs that are already approved, but do so more precisely to avoid the side effects. That may be the first step for improving molecular therapeutic or delivering them exactly where they're needed. Mm -hmm. uh, on a more uh, sort of longer uh, horizon, we can help, uh, for example, Guaping and Fung to deliver genetic tools to, to again, to locations where they're needed. If we're interested in, for example, modifying gene inside the brain, we don't necessarily want to modify that gene everywhere. And we don't necessarily want to flush the entire organism with this very large load of a viral vector. So what we could uh, do is to package the viral vectors into magnetic carriers and then use the magnetic fields to guide them uh, where those vectors are needed so that they can do their job and uh, fix that mutation in the correct uh, location in the brain or anywhere else in the body. Lovely, so you can all kind of synergize with each other, <laughs> the work that you're doing. Paulina, just to stay with you for one question, uh, this question is getting a lot of upvotes. Are there proteins in nature that respond to electromagnetic fields, like some animals use for migration that could be cloned and used in magnetic nanobots? So uh, this is a fascinating question and my group has been thinking about it for, for a while and there um, has been quite a bit of controversy in the field about magnetic response of uh, naturally occurring proteins. Uh, despite decades of vigorous research, we still don't actually understand how the organisms uh, sense magnetic field. For example, how do pigeons nav navigate or how do even um, uh, insects navigate? There are some hypotheses that are based on um, uh, sort of uh, symmetries that are associated not really with magnetic particles, but more with magnetic response of molecules uh, that have been implicated in this magnetoreception, but generally those mechanisms rely on light. And it's very difficult to deliver light um, into the, for example, to deep brain without implants. And I'm sure Ed can comment uh, more on that. Uh, there are magnetotactic bacteria in, in nature that make beautiful magnetic nanoparticles that uh, definitely rival any synthetic chemist. Um, however, the genes for, uh, to create those magneto uh, magnetosomes inside uh, mammalian cells uh, require quite sophisticated engineering because most of those bacteria are actually anaerobic, so uh, they don't do well with oxygen. However, I mean, it is uh, definitely worth considering if uh, we could uh, um, teach ourselves to make the nanoparticles themselves, then maybe we wouldn't need to involve the synthetic chemist, but instead uh, use the biology. That said, uh, to be continued. Yeah, to be continued. Thank you. Um, Ed, first of all, do you want to add anything to that? And second of all, here's a juicy question for you. How long does your lab pursue a crazy idea before you realize it's not possible to implement right now, or <laughs> are ideas pursued year after year? Oh. Well, I, I couldn't say it better than what you've already heard from our fantastic 
experts and collaborators on, on the timeline to the clinic. Uh, it's, uh, it's really great to be part of this amazing team. As far as uh, the process of uh, innovation, that's something I like to think about actually, because um, there's often a big gap between the knowledge that an idea is possible or at least not impossible and the wisdom to know that it's a good idea. Um, so this expansion idea, for example, um, we originally had the idea in our group back in 2006, 2007, um, but we didn't realize that it was a really important idea until we tried lots of methods of nano imaging and found out that they were very slow. It was hard to imagine how they would scale up to a large complex brain circuit. And so in 2012, um, two grad students in my group who actually were working on nano imaging and getting frustrated with how slow it was, we started working on the expansion project then. So one thing that we do a lot of is what I call failure rebooting. Sometimes there's knowledge, but not yet wisdom, or sometimes an idea that's been around for a while, suddenly the world's different and it becomes valuable. I mean, we hear a lot about machine learning nowadays. A lot of the mathematics goes back to the 80s and 90s, but with big data and faster computing, machine learning is now suddenly able to go at a much faster pace. And so we see this example throughout the sciences and engineering fields. So is there anything that you see coming in the immediate future where the two things are coming together, the wisdom and the knowledge to explode into something beautiful? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're thinking a lot now about imaging the living brain. That's a very difficult thing to do because you need to deal with the delicacy of neurons and not interfere with the normal function. And get, getting fast three-dimensional multimodal images of the brain is, is very challenging. And so right now we uh, are very actively uh, trying to figure out, are there new tricks or hacks that we can bring into the field of live brain imaging? And hopefully that will be very useful for revealing the coordination between signals in the brain. You know, there's many, many things going on in the brain at once. And that's one of the reasons that molecular therapeutics is challenging. Where in the network do you want to intervene? But if you could watch five or 10 or more things at once and say, oh, that one happens first, or those three things always go together then you can start to see the patterns. And so that's something that we're, that we're working very hard towards right now. Very cool. Fun, quick question. What are the ongoing CRISPR clinical trials meant to treat and are there any results yet? Yeah, um, so uh, CRISPR or Cas9 has already been applied in, in two different clinical trials. Uh, one of them is for the treatment of blood, uh, sickle cell type of disorders uh, like thalassemia and also uh, just sickle cell. Uh, last year, uh, a Cambridge-based um, co company called CRISPR Therapeutics uh, released data from two patients. Uh, one of them uh, is a thalassemia patient and uh, have found that uh, they were able to elevate um, the, the level of um, uh, sort of fetal hemoglobin expression. Uh, and then the, the patients are um, or have been transfusion free. Uh, so they didn't have to go into the hospital. So that, that was a very promising uh, result for, for the whole field. Um, Editas Medicine, um, which I helped to co-found, um, have um, uh, dosed a patient uh, with an AAV carrying Cas9 into the eye uh, to target a mutation that leads to blindness. And, uh, and, and that trial is also uh, progressing. So those are the two that are inhuman uh, already, but there are a number of other trials that I think are, under, uh, are, are being developed and, and marching toward uh, clinical testing. Um, so I think in the coming, a few years, we're going to see uh, more and more applications. And then certainly as uh, safety data and also efficacy data come back from these initial uh, trials, especially for sickle cell disease and also for, for blindness, um, I think developer, drug developers will be able to uh, further uh, refine the system and, and then be able to go after more, more uh, indications. Thank you. Question for Guoping. Adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress change the developing brain, especially in children ages birth to age five. Will there be a role for molecular therapeutics in this area? Ah, that's a really good question. This is actually exactly some of the uh, things we are very interested in. It is, you know, in animal model studies, well known that uh, if you really uh, stress out um, uh, during development, you will make permanent change in the brain. Exactly how, what are changes we need to add? The expansion microscope really figure out which part, you know, what exactly, the change is not grossly like abnormal, but it's just this refinement of neural circuits. If you think about all humans, all, all animals, when we were born, 
all the circuits there, the connection already made, but it's refined, right? So, so everything is refined. That's why how you, that's why your experience makes you a very unique, a specific. So, so if if you think about the, uh, the environment change, let, let's say you know adverse events or all these things, it will really significantly impact your brain development in the young. Age. And, that, and once that's all, the development has a called a critical window. Once you pass that, it's much harder to change. So that's why you will have permanent change or damage to the child brain. So, so the question is to figure out is what is that window. And how can we, what is the change? Let's say, you know, add a figure out way how in, in, imaging the neuronal activity in the whole brain in live without the damage. Then we can figure out which part is wrong and we can go in and fix it. And if basically you will permanent. So these are things that can be done in animal models now, partially, still not imaging the whole brain activity, but part by part, by based on our knowledge, we can go imaging it. So in the future, if this can be done in humans, imaging figure out which part is actually affected, then we can potentially to permanently fix it if we treat it at the right time uh, during development. So, so there is a critical, there is a critical window, but it is also a postnatal window. That means there's a period of time, our brain is very plastic. Even something goes wrong, there is a chance you can go fix it and permanently fix it. So we can, we need to catch that window. I think about that a lot with COVID, but with the pandemic and a lot of kids missing their usual windows in terms of school. Yeah. And yeah, it's okay. Uh, we only have about three or four minutes left. I'd like to end with a lightning round, which is um, there's a great question that came in and I'd like to ask each of the panelists what your less than one minute answer is. So the question is, what do you think will be the first brain disorder that will be cured? But I'd like to shift the question a little bit and say, what do you think will be the first brain disorder that will be cured with molecular therapeutics? So um, Fung, why don't you take it first? Okay, I'll give it a try. Um, so I, I think um, the, the ones that are most tractable are the ones where uh, we have a relatively clear understanding of the disease mechanism. So monogenic diseases or inherited genetic diseases like Huntington's, uh, Frederick's ataxia are, are going to be more uh, tractable because they are single target and, and we can design a therapeutic against those. Uh, so so my, my, my thinking is that those will be the first wave uh, of treatments. Great. Thank you. Uh, Paulina. So uh, I'm... Uh, I would give it a guess, something that we already have a good drug therapy for, but where uh, side effects are really debilitating and we can avoid them. So a couple of examples? Uh, good examples would be depression and Parkinson's. Great, thank you. Ed? Yeah, so this is a, um, a, a tough question. I think uh, Polina and, and Fung have already done a, a great job of addressing it. I guess where, where our group comes in is often through our imaging strategies, as Gold Payne was alluding to earlier, how can we put the other diseases on the same playing field? Can we map out systematically the changes so that we do have insights into mechanisms? And uh, there are lots of conditions, of course, which are not monogenic or for which we don't have a good candidate. But if we can try to get detailed molecular maps um, of gene expression and protein content and nano organization at scale, um, can we use machine learning to pinpoint new targets? So I know, I know I'm not answering your question, <laughs> but this is kind of how we think about it in our group is, you know, there's a lot of people where, where we don't currently know how to help them. And if we can try to tackle those diseases. So we're looking at Alzheimer's right now, we're looking at Parkinson's disease, um, looking at a variety of, of conditions where there, there might be many things in, in a delicate interplay. So complex. It's just, it's always, whenever I report on the brain, I end up saying, oh God, it's so complex. <laughs> Guo Ping. So, yeah, so for cure, I think the my view is the um, earliest will come from some of the neurodevelopment disorders because they are some of them are monogenic and our brain are much more plastic during de during development. So if we treat them early enough, we can actually have a really a, probably a real cure for some of the monogenic neurodevelopment disorders, including severe autism spectrum disorders. Got it. 
Thank you. So I want to thank all of our panelists so much. I The pleasant surprise for me was not that you were each doing amazing research, but how much it all can interplay and interact and, and synergize uh, in, in, in various ways. So I think we're about to put up on the screen a slide that will let people know how to remain involved and connected with the new Yang Tan Center. Um, and uh, so there, there you have it bookmark it. And I want to extend just my greatest thanks to all of our panelists for being with us. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to be with all of you. And thank you.